see that my topic is up here, essentially a story of my father. Uh, but before we get going, uh, I would like to highlight our next two upcoming coffee and conversation talks. Uh, on the 24th of April, week after next, our speaker will be Jim Whitlock. Uh, and this is much different than most of the talks we've had in the past because Jim served as one of the major mechanics on an Atlas missile site. All those sites you have buried up in Wyoming, you know, Montana and stuff that we occasionally run across as we're driving, that's where he spent his time. And again, these missiles are still out there. They're still, you know, on readiness. Uh, the Atlas missile has long since been replaced, uh, but the story of what Jim did and the thousands of Air Force uh, men and women who service these things still need to be told. So I think that'll be fantastic. And then in 8 May, Tom does, uh, Colonel Tom does, retired U.S. Marine Corps, is going to join us all the way from Colorado Springs. Uh, and Tom, uh, had served 30 years with the Marine Corps and basically retired in 2008. And 10 of those years, he was doing the same kind of things that the 10th Mountain Division uh, did during World War II. He traveled up in Norway and did all sorts of things. And so he's become very interested in the history of that. So even though we've had one or two talks already on the 10th Mountain Division, uh, Tom wants to come up and tell us his part of the whole story. Uh, so that'll be great. Uh, keep your fingers crossed that we don't have a big snowstorm. We're always due for about one more during this before spring's over. And then the 22nd of May, or around there, we're still doing a lot of coordination. We're going to, going to have a special presentation uh, related to the history and accomplishments of Admiral Arleigh Burke. Uh, Admiral Burke grew, was born in Boulder, a local resident, had a distinguished career during World War II, eventually rising up to uh, Chief of Naval Operations. And I think we have a very special speaker coming. Uh, I'll have more details on that as we get closer. It also, it is yes, it is? Oh, great, Dick. Uh, and this will be connected with a new special exhibit upstairs in our rotating exhibit area about the history and accomplishments of Admiral Burke. Uh, I would like to have been able to say Admiral Burke and my father kind of had worked together across paths uh, in the Solomon Islands during World War II. Uh, unfortunately, he came out to assume command of a destroyer division uh, just after my father's ship was sunk. But anyway, the story, uh, the title I think is quite appropriate. Uh, it really was a story of discovery for me. Delayed many years, uh, and I'll kind of go through the steps on that. The culmination, I would have to say, was with, with the assistance of a great friend, Flint Whitlock here, a very distinguished author, also the editor for the World War II Quarterly Journal. And as we kind of I developed some things to tell my father's story a little bit, I exhibit upstairs, Flint actually gets the credit. He's the author of a marvelous article in here, even though it lists me there, uh, which basically tells the story not only of my father, but other key admirals and stuff in the major battles of the Solomon Islands. So I'll have this out here. Uh, but if you really want to talk to someone who knows literally everything, that's Flint. And plus, so much of what you see in our museum uh, is a result of his efforts, and we just follow along. So anyway, that's there. Uh, probably the question many of us have always had, particularly growing up, is, Dad, what did you do in the war? I was born in the late 40s. So obviously my father had served. I knew I was in a Navy family. Uh, and growing up, you know, it's not the kind of thing you sit around the dining room table talking at dinner. Y you know, the war is terrible. Uh, 
And so I kind of knew Dad was, in, well, I knew he was in the Navy. Uh, you know, I think his two citations, the Navy Cross, Silver Star, and a photo of Dad or so, and a picture of the Gwen was always up on the wall. So I kind of knew that. And every now and then, you would learn a little bit more. I think I didn't know anything much about Navy service and everything until I'd say I was in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade. At that time, we were living in Italy. Uh, Dad was senior captain, getting ready to become a rear admiral, headed up the Mediterranean Surface Transportation. No, Mediterranean Surface Transportation. No, Mediterranean Surface Transportation Service. I always mess that up. <laughs> Which basically is responsible for all logistic shipping within the Mediterranean. Well, we lived in Livorno, uh, and every time a ship came in, and most times, we would have the captain and executive officer over for dinner. And that was, I thought, pretty nifty. Uh, they all looked old, well tanned. If they were in khakis, uh, all seemed to be about my father's age, which to an eight-year-old, I mean, eighth grade, they're old. <laughs> but they were all World War II veterans, I'm sure. And the thing which I enjoyed, I would just sit around after dinner while they tell stories. And that's what I've kind of enjoyed about our museum. We all sit around afterwards and we tell stories. And it's not a, well, why? Okay, I wouldn't say that. Maybe we're stretching things, enhancing a little bit. But I enjoyed listening to them. And it was about battles and everything. It was, oh, do you remember so-and-so? Oh, well, we were anchored up off of some little town in Alaska. And in fact, one of them was, you know, we would stop there. Anytime you come into one of the small towns, all the girls in the fishing, uh, canning things would come out and we'd have parties and just, it was just fun. And then dad retired, so that kind of went away. And then I think the next time I really kind of felt I got to know him was I'd, long, I'd been in the Army for about four years, had a head company command, Vietnam, uh, a young son. In fact, I should point out, the gentleman in the back left-hand corner there uh, is my son Christian. And Christian, career Army officer, was born in the Philippines while I was in Vietnam. Uh, and like any dutiful family, trailed on after me for years as we bounced around. But anyway, I was back in Boston uh, going to grad school. And my father and I just started meeting for lunch uh, about every other week uh, at the Boston Naval Shipyard uh, Officers Club. And now the conversation was different. Two, our, two officers, one much more senior, experienced one junior, but we had stories to tell. And we'd just start telling them to each other. And I started to learn more about him and what he did. And then just suddenly it stopped. Uh, Dad died suddenly of a heart attack. And he was only about 61. You know, that was not, I guess, that uncommon back then. Uh, and the war had taken, you know, severe, you know, physical things on all of them, uh, certainly smoking and everything. So I inherited Dad's sea chest. Uh, it had all sorts of secrets and stuff in it. In fact, for all of us who've served in, I'll bet we all have our equivalent sea chest. I have an Army footlocker, which has followed me around for 26 more years. Uh, it's now out in the garage. It was a collection of everything I picked up along the way and stuff. And at some point, Pris or whoever will have to probably go through that and figure out what it means. But anyway. We had it, it followed me around for about 40 years until I finally settled down in Colorado and above all joined the Veterans Museum. And lo and behold, one of our board members, Bob Sieber, World War II veteran, Navy, off of Okinawa, you know, and we talked and he said, you know, you really ought to do something to sort out and understand what your father did. And so yes, I kind of, that started. It started a detective story. Uh, because, you know, as soon as you open it, it's like stepping back in history a little bit. 
what I found nifty, well, nice, is Dad had said this was built by a carpenter on one of his ships. Well, it had to be one of the later ships, because it certainly wasn't on the Gwyn. Uh, but it was nicely built. You could see nice mitered corners. It had metal kind of fittings around the edge, lined with heavy canvas. Uh, this was put a lot of work into this. So just opening it, first thing I saw was the flag uh, that was draped over my father's coffin, folded by a you know, Navy Honor Guard and presented to my mother. There was his hat, a box here, which just was a hodgepodge collection of medals, some of which are here, which Flynn actually nicely mounted for an exhibit upstairs. And you can see all sorts of rolled up certificates, everything. So slowly but surely you kind of go through, oh, and there was a, an oil, oil, oil portrait of Dad, I think probably done when he was in Italy, uh, crammed in there, and I think I remember seeing it up. Uh, amongst lots of stuff. Well, came across uh, Navy Cross and Silver Star, the citations. Uh, a bunch of photos, all class typed uh, on the back, uh, confidential or secret, uh, but nothing else on it. Uh, so there was kind of a detective story trying to figure out. Uh, whoops, let me go back. Uh, certainly this is a classic image. And even I could kind of tell from just history books and stuff, that probably was the Yorktown. But a question, why would there be an image with a whale boat obviously heading over there? Here's one, a bunch of destroyers and some other ships and some sort of almost like a fjord thing. Uh, but I had a sensing what the latter one was because amongst Dad's things, was one of this marvelous certificate, I have it right here, uh, which commemorates Lieutenant John Fellows crossing the Arctic Circle. And this was October 5th, 41. The war hadn't started then. So kind of a question was, what were they doing up there uh, in the fall of 41? Oh, other things in here, there are lots of different things. This was kind of a very tongue in cheek rendition of his experiences when he was part of the UN armistice group in Korea sometime later in his career. Ah, I found a whole set of plans for the, for the USS Gwynn uh, in all sorts of detail, and there's just the profile there. Uh, but anything you wanted to know about the Gwynn in terms of its systems, boy, we had the, all the plans. Uh, news articles. Always, we all have assortment of that. And then what I wasn't expecting was some classified after action reports. Uh, all stamped confidential and stuff. Uh, but landing in Rondova Island, where the heck was that? Well, one thing you could tell, they're all roughly the same period in 43, June through July. Uh, so something was going on up in the Kula Gulf area, uh, which I never hear mentioned when we talk about Guadalcanal, but anyway. And finally, there was one about the night action, which led to the loss of the Gwyn. Now this, I thought, was quite interesting because it covered his whole career, and I finally had some insight into kind of what he did along the way. Uh, but this transcript of naval service, and you can see early on as a young lieutenant and stuff, you serve on a series of different vessels in different capacities. Uh, and uh, some of our past speakers, the young officers who've been in the Navy, talk about a similar type experience. You it's kind of on-the-job training uh, in various positions. And you can kind of see a little bit as you kind of go along the way. What was interesting, some of them we find again, the Chicago, Talbot, Warden, crop up in the Solomon Islands again. What did found quite interesting is all of us probably remember from our history books, the Lend-Lease program started by Roosevelt was an effort to be able to give uh, the British 40 of our very old destroyers without having to sell them. The British didn't have the money to buy them. Uh, but if we would give it to them, they would lease us some of their bases for the next 50 years. And lo and behold, the Cronin, whoops, shoot, always got to be, 
the Cronin Shield was one of them. So lo and behold, Dad was executive officer for the transfer of the Cronin Shield of British Navy up in Halifax. And I would love to have seen some pictures of the ceremony and stuff like that. Uh, but hey, that was something I didn't know. And then finally down here, the USS Gwynn cropped up. So from October 40, you know, to August 43, engineering officer, then executive officer, then commanding officer. Now granted, this extended on all the way to 58, and there were other things, but for purpose of this talk, we're gonna stop at the Gwynn. So what was the Gwynn? Uh, the Gwynn was a Gleaves class destroyer. This isn't the fabulous Fletcher one we always hear. That came about two classes later. Uh, you can see it was built uh, in the Boston Navy shipyard. I think that's kind of why Dad has a, always had a kind of a soft flavor for the yard. Uh, not one of the biggest. The Fletchers start coming in around 2,300 tons, uh, 350, 36, but the lengths and widths and all seem to be about the same. Two Westinghouse propulsion plants, two screws, can be pretty speedy when you want it to be, and a fair amount of cruising range, but you know, that's 12 knots. When you want to chug away at 25 knots or more, it's a lot shorter. The Gwynn was the third ship with that name, and again, named after Lieutenant Commander William Gwynn, uh, who was sighted by, several times by General Grant uh, as he commanded gunboats on the Ohio River and the Mississippi was involved in the, the seizing of Fort uh, Henry and Donelson, uh, which kind of started Grant's rise to power. Uh, came down to Shiloh to help bail uh, Grant out from the attack there. It was sighted in dispatches and finally was mortally wounded uh, during the Battle of the Yazoo River as they were attempting to get around Vicksburg. Uh, the launching was commemorated by Mrs. Jessie Lippincott, who is great nephew of Lieutenant Commander Gwynn. So anyway, uh, what was a World War II destroyer and a Gwynn look like? We have an excellent model upstairs. If you've never seen one, go see it. It's a Fletcher class destroyer. So it's a little bigger, a little more capable. This is a schematic of, of a Fletcher class. Don't worry, the only thing I wanna point out on it is at this stage, you generally always had two independent uh, boilers, plant, boilers there. Each one could be rigged differently to propel the screws in the back. Uh, main armament, which we'll talk about briefly, five inch guns. Uh, the Fletcher had, I think, even up to five. Uh, the Gleaves class had four. Looking at some of the armament, again, the big gun, if you can call it a big gun, was the five inch 38 calibers. Uh, designed really as an anti-aircraft defense. You wouldn't want to take on a cruiser or battleship with this thing. This is a pop gun compared to what they have. Uh, but with the proximity fuse and stuff, you could do pretty well uh, against aircraft. Uh, for land bombardment, you could do pretty well, and in fact, Destroyers with five-inch guns uh, provided ground support all the way through Vietnam. Uh, for any aircraft, you basically, the Gleaves only had the 20 millimeter gun. Uh, you see any of the pictures of Victory at Sea, uh, you see all sorts of pictures of these guns being used. This is last, you know, 100 yards coming at you with this thing. Uh, the Fletchers also added what the 44, a 40 millimeter pom-pom guns, which were more effective. And for some reason or another, they still had 60, 50 caliber machine guns as part of their, their basic load. I have no idea what they would use them for other than in case you had to go ashore. No way to really mount them and, uh, and stuff. Of course, they all had depth charges. Uh, the Glees had two racks in the stern. Uh, later vessels had more and even could shoot them off to the side. And then the notorious torpedo. Uh, for uh, uh, 
there's that Mark 13, which was for aircraft and stuff. 14 was submarines. Mark 15 were destroyers. Uh, the first thing out of the box, if you compare the Mark 15, its range compared to, shoot. It, yeah, you know, trouble always touching the wrong thing. Look at the difference between the Japanese Type 93 torpedo, its range. 44,000 yards versus 8,200. We had to get close enough to the ships to fire at them before we could fire these out. The Japanese, in fact, made a, a total, uh, that was their strategy. You stood off, you put your destroyers out front, you fired out a spread of these things before you ever got close enough to fire. And then the destroyers peeled away. And then they reloaded. We never reloaded, learned to reload. And then after the firing goes on, the ships start kind of sinking or getting hit. Destroyers come back in and pick them off with combination of, again, the next round of uh, torpedoes. But what was, yeah, and the size of the warheads, Japanese was about 1,000 pounds. Initially, these were about 400. But there was even worse. The American torpedoes did not work. The Bureau of Ordnance uh, for Navy claimed they were perfect. They didn't. You fired them at a ship, set the depth at 12 feet. The thing ran at 25 feet. Time and again, submarine commanders right in the beginning of the war, and even in here, <laughs> would fire point blank range at it, and nothing would happen. They claimed they had a marvelous a magnetic uh, proximity fuse. You didn't have to hit the ship. You just had to come underneath it, and then it would blow up and break the keel. Well, that didn't work. Shoot, kept going. And then worse upon worse, even when you hit the dang thing, primarily out of luck, it still didn't go off. Because the, the fuse, the you know, contact fuse crushed. So you know, for the first two years of the war, submariners, destroyers, PT boats, everyone complained that something's wrong. And the Bureau Ordinance, no, not us, it's you guys. So anyway, that, that I just, I just was furious the more I read about this. So anyway, okay, Dad's now joined the Gwyn. What did you initially do? Well, initially, uh, yeah. Well, you immediately joined the Atlantic Fleet. There are about 40 of them, uh, which had the responsibility for kind of patrolling the coast and all that stuff. Uh, in August of 41, well, actually June of 41, Germany attacked Russia. By August of 41, we were beginning to authorize Lend-Lease convoys, which basically were going up the Mermats. British had responsibility for most of the way, but they needed help. So in September, the Gwyn was assigned as part of a task force by, uh, I guess it was Admiral Stark at that time, uh, said, we need you, well, we want you guys to start patrolling the Denmark Strait, that's that area up through there, because there was concerns that we had the Tirpitz and the Bismarck, you know, the pocket battleships, which had been cruising around in that area. Uh, and so we at least were up there doing something. They were based out of kind of a fjord in the north side of Iceland called whatever. It's hard to, I can't even pronounce it. But now that explains that picture. It also explains his certificate. So again, it's like a detective story. Every little bit, the more I kind of research, you learn a little bit more about this. And again, the shooting war essentially had started in October. USS Kearney was torpedoed uh, as it was patrolling along short of Iceland. And of course, the Reuben James uh, was sunk not long afterwards. So that kind of kept Dad busy, obviously, pre-war. As soon as the war started, it appears that a bunch of the destroyers, the Chicago and others, were all kind of shifted to the Pacific. And so what we're seeing is in February, the Gwyn deployed down through the Panama Canal, 
up to uh, San Diego, where I saw a little record saying we pulled in here to get stores and everything. Uh, and then they were shuttled up to San Francisco. And lo and behold, they joined the Task Force 18, which was the task force that screened the USS Hornet as it left San Francisco and did its you know, famous mission out to uh, bomb Tokyo and various other places there. There also, which I didn't know, was a Task Force 16, which went along, which had the USS Enterprise. And that paralleled the Hornet and stuff and provided air cover if needed. So lo and behold, you raced out there, came back, and then immediately almost were turned around to head to the Coral Sea uh, because there was thought that we were going to need to provide some additional support uh, to Lexington and whoever else was out there. But it came back. What you do see is that was a busy time for not just the Gwyn, but all the destroyers and stuff we had there. So 23 May, uh, and I didn't know this either, uh, we sent a contingent out there with a Marine commando unit to try and uh, uh, reinforce Midway because we knew the, J the Japanese were coming. So lo and behold, the Gwyn raced out there to came back, come back, 3 through 6 June, Battle of Midway, Hornet Enterprise in Yorktown. Uh, 3rd of June, Gwyn departed to head to Midway. And I think they must have had some other ships with them. But again, it was to assist out there. Arrives finding New Yorktown under tow. And I see a little record in the thing saying they sent a salvage party to assist the crew. Aha. That explains that and the other, other images here. So they did send a salvage party out, worked with them, eventually brought them back because it became obvious Yorktown was not going to survive. And then lo and behold, the USS Hammond, another destroyer, pulled alongside the Yorktown to evacuate the remaining people, and boom, uh, it was torpedoed uh, by a Japanese sub. Again, I could see a lot of arguments. Well, with all the other ships and destroyers around, well, didn't you really even detect it? Well, if you have a standoff torpedo that can go 44,000 yards, you have a big fat target that's sitting still. You send a spread of torpedoes, and he could be well way off. And plus, uh, uh, the Japanese torpedoes didn't leave this air track that ours did. So I'm sure the submarine just sat way off in the distance, set a spread of torpedoes, and certainly something was going to hit. And that's what happened. So anyway, tension now turns to the Solomon Islands. Well, why the Solomon Islands? Well, this is kind of the overall map of the Pacific, and this is normally upstairs. But the significance of the Solomon Islands is they sit right along in here. Well, Australia is down here. Australia is going to be critical for us rewinning this, the Pacific War in terms of coming up through Borneo and New Guinea and all that stuff. So you can almost draw a straight line from Midway down through New the Hebrides and down to Australia. The Solomon Islands are right on the tip here. Whoever controls that with aviation assets can make it pretty difficult for getting you know, ships through there. So this became now a kind of a strategic importance. And let me just point out a few things. Essentially, it became a battle between two major headquarters groups. The Japanese, uh, let's see, London, New Jersey, oh, Rabaul. That was the major base the Japanese had up here, both for air assets and naval assets. From that, you can control everything going along down through New Guinea, the Coral Sea. And now, they became the major focus for control down through, the, through what was called the slot, the, the Solomon Islands. For the US, down New Hebrides, about 600 miles away from Guadalcanal, uh, was no. Touch the wrong thing. Oops. God. Jeez. Okay. Was Espirito Santo. 
the New Hebrides Island. That became the headquarters for Admiral Halsey and all our focus. So you almost have two teams, one way up here trying to orchestrate the Japanese one, the ones down here, the U.S., being the focal point for uh, the fight up through here. Here's Guadalcanal, Florida Island. In fact, as we kind of look here, now the names start making sense to me as you start reading. Guadalcanal, Lunga Point, and Henderson Field. This is the area, this is the battlefield, which really the Marines you know, made tremendous history in defending. Uh, later on, Tosferango was an area the Japanese would tr be landing uh, additional soldiers all up through here. Cape Esperance, Savo Island, which we'll comment briefly. This is called Iron Bottom Sound. Uh, it's got the name because of the number of ships that are sunk in that area. And as you kind of cruise over it, supposedly it still impacts uh, compass readings. Uh, Florida Island and Tulagi. All were names that I didn't connect with anything, but as you kind of go through, you can kind of see that. What also struck me is I've always read about the tremendous battle the Marines had, and that kind of shapes their history. It shapes even the Army. Uh, the 25th Infantry Division I served with in Vietnam relieved the Marines on Guadalcanal and fought during other phases of the war. But what I didn't realize was here, if you look at the total naval losses in terms of ships between the Japanese and us, ultimately it was about the same, although we lost two carriers along with this, but almost you know, three times the number of sailors were killed in the subsequent battles just for Guadalcanal than the Marines and the Army lost during their battles. So anyway, what did the Gwen do, just quickly? Well, July, it departed with Task Force 16, again, built around the Enterprise, and they were there tasked to provide the air support for the initial invasion. And that's what it kind of, shoot, that's what it kind of shows here. Uh, then in August to September, it was just kind of mundane. You needed to start escorting tankers, supply ships, everything into, you know, build up the forces within, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Guadalcanal. And again, es Espirito Santo shows up continually. Uh, <coughs> again, September to October, again, uh, conveying transports which are moving Guadalcanal to other locations and everything. And at that point, it just became hard to really say, what am I, you know, the Gwyn and all the other destroyers were all over the place doing stuff. So the other thing, what I just kind of noticed is uh, to really understand what happened to the Gwyn and everything, you had to at least have a basic understanding of what were the many battles in the Solomon Islands. And that's what I find always confusing. Uh, some of them have different names. Uh, you sometimes don't find a lot written about them, but now you do. Uh, so it just wasn't one battle. There was a whole kind of flow. And all of it was kind of to counter what we call the Tokyo Express. It was the continual efforts by the Japanese to first wipe out Henderson Field any way they could, primarily bombardment. And then while they're occupying ourselves, to now slip in additional troops, supplies, and everything such that they can finally seize Henderson Field. Uh, the only, the ones that I was just going to highlight here is this battle here my father was involved in. In the others, he generally was doing the regular support missions. The two I'd like to kind of highlight just in the beginning, Battle of Savo Island, we got clobbered. This was a real bloody learning lesson for the U.S. Navy. Uh, we hadn't yet adjusted to a kind of a war-type environment. Uh, the ships we had available were covering around Savo Island. Uh, they weren't even at general quarters, even though uh, alerts were out the Japanese were coming. Messages never got to the commander. He thought his sailors were pretty tired, and they were, so he let him rest. The two destroyers they put out to, uh, you know, 
catch anyone coming through, sail toward each other, and then sail the other way. And guess what happened when they sailed the other way? The Japanese forces just by luck came right through, caught them flat-footed, uh, sank literally every cruiser we had in there, and a bunch of the destroyers. Basically wiped out the immediate forces we had there. So pretty much from that time on through even Cape Esperance and beyond, every time we had a major battle, we withdrew. Japanese came right back, you know, loaded more troops down, uh, and uh, came down and plastered uh, Henderson Field. And needless to say, the Navy and the Cactus Air Force, which is what we call the collection of planes and everything there, were not very happy. In terms of the challenges the Japanese had is, look at the distance. The Tokyo Express basically started off. You had what composed them generally was a screening group, which was basically your destroyers, kind of went along. Typically then had the big guns, the bombardment group cruisers, and later a couple battleships. And then hanging on behind there, kind of waiting to see what happens there, is a transport group, which early on was actually big cargo ships uh, and destroyers. And as soon as they heard that these guys had more or less taken care of things, they could race down to drop off the forces here. But that's about 1,000 miles. And the danger point for all of them was this last 200 miles. This was about the stretch that the Cactus Air Force, these were our Hellcats and all our other planes, uh, could get out. So during the day, U.S. forces, and particularly the Air Force, could control the slot. At night, pretty much the Japanese controlled it. So you'd start off here at some point during the day, structured such that by the time you get down here, it would be dark, you know, around 2,000 hours, 2,100 uh, by then, and then you make your last quick push to come down, drop your troops off. If you weren't able to do that and get out of that range in the morning, this is what frequently happened. Uh, you weren't able to finish off loading, and in some cases, this particularly after uh, Battle of Cape Esperance, uh, they just drove the ships ashore and tried to offload them there. Again, if the air, once the aircraft were up, you couldn't even get away with that. The thing, the more I read, uh, you know, I just had complete admiration for the sailors who had to do night battles. Uh, and one way, it was difficult to find any description of it, but there were two books that I came across. Actually, this one was given to me by Bill Humphreys. Uh, and I don't think he, but a friend or whatever, had served in the USS Sterrett. Sterrett was a destroyer in the Solomon Islands, which survived during that whole period. And now and then, I'd run across the name Sterrett uh, as we describe different battles. Another book I thought was excellent was called South Pacific Destroyer. Uh, and that was uh, written by the uh, executive officer of the USS Maury, another destroyer. Uh, what I thought was great is they described what life was like on there and what everyone kind of felt as you're steaming, you know, up toward another engagement. Uh, and here's one of the nights when the moon was at least a sliver up. And you can imagine, hot, steamy, you're steaming forward at 25 knots toward an enemy who's coming at you at 25 knots, somewhere out there, that means 50 miles an hour plus you're coming toward each other. Uh, early on, we didn't have radar in all of our ships. So everyone's out there screen, trying to f capture, you know, see what we can with binoculars. If you're down in the engine room, can you imagine the heat and the noise with that? If you're the guys down in the magazine area, it's getting ready to put the sh five inch shells up. And once the firing starts, you hear nothing. You know, and if you suddenly get hit by a torpedo, chunk, your whole world's gone. Radar came along 
partway into this, you started seeing it showing up on some cruisers and some destroyers. What the great thing about SG radar was, you actually could get a little screen which would show little dots. And lo and behold, you could kind of tell where all the ships were initially. But as soon as the firing starts and everything scatters, how do you keep track of what all the little dots are? And later on, we were able to kind of, with the SG radar, perfect it down into a plotting room and actually have it control uh, your guns. And the benefit for that is whoever gets off the first accurate shots normally wins the battle. That's because as soon as you, you start impacting your, your enemy here, you go from total darkness or almost total darkness to suddenly big flares and lights all out. As soon as you see a thing like that, what do you think your gunners are going to do? There's your target. And you just pump it a little more. So the importance of getting those first shots in improved tremendously uh, once we kind of had radar. And the other thing I, I just couldn't understand, I mean, there's no place to hide on a ship. You know, once you start receiving fire, to us in the Army, we always say, well, it's shrapnel, you know, that kills you and stuff. Well, on a ship, it's steel splinters, essentially shrapnel. But what happens when a shell hits, let's say, a wall or something like that, yeah, it does it. But then inside, it's a whole spectrum uh, of steel, little pieces that come all the way through. And time again, as you read the kind of after reports of just the description, uh, you know, Admiral Scott and his big thing, whole bridge was wiped out. And basically, you can just imagine what it did to, you know, bodies and stuff. And it wasn't just that. Time and again, before we even closed to where we could talk and fire our guns, uh, we already had ships exploding all around us uh, because the long lance torpedoes were, were coming at you big time. Uh, the other thing I learned a little bit later, even though with, you have radar gunnery, once the firing starts, and particularly with big shells, you, you start getting water spouts all over the place as near misses. Well, those water spouts also show up on radar. And if your system is set to try and compensate for that, you're trying, you end up shooting at a lot of ghosts. And time and again, that's kind of the eventual uh, decision uh, in terms of firing 1,000 rounds at a, so a target, and they could only confirm 20 rounds actually hit it. And of course, you have unpleasant surprises when all the guns fire at once. Uh, we never did that during peacetime. And lo and behold, on the bigger ships, when you suddenly fire them all, things start falling apart. Your electronics fail. <laughs> you know, uh, the radios that are up on a kind of a shelf and things suddenly fall off. Tubes break. Uh, electric uh, fuse things trip. Uh, all sorts of stuff happens. And it took some time to figure that out. So get, just getting back a little bit to the battles of Solomon Islands, I just want to, we'll vent, I'll talk about this. Uh, but before we do it, you really need to talk about this, the first naval battle of Solomon Islands. And this is often called the cruiser night action. So sometimes it gets to be a, a confusing of what the battles are called. And this is the second naval battle again, or the battleship action. What happened here, and we're not going to get into big detail, was <clears throat> Admiral Halsey knew that the Japanese finally were getting serious. This time they were going to send the big guns down through there, down through the slot to pound uh, Henderson Field. Up until then it had been cruisers, and their shells are smaller, six inch or so. Now you're talking 14 inch, 16 inch. And lo and behold, it's going to be combined with Oops, shoot, a transport group. Uh, again, destroyers and all that stuff. All we had was left over at that point were a series of cruisers, and most of them were light. Uh, 
the Atlanta actually wasn't even a normal cruiser, it was an anti-aircraft. Its guns, maximum was five inch, but there were lots of them. So very quickly, they had to put together an order of battle. The Japanese kind of came down the normal slot here. Uh, the main force, the single line, had a cruiser, two battleships. Destroyers were spread out on either side. Admiral Callahan, who had his force, we tended to keep our ships in a nice line uh, because we thought we could control them better. Problem was, we said we were going to control them with radio, and normally you lose that. So what happened? We kind of knew they were coming, kind of came up in a single line. Bef Admiral uh, Callahan, Rear Admiral, was in the San Francisco. That didn't have radar. The other ships did. So he didn't realize what was happening until they already were amongst each other. So basically, you had a barroom brawl in the dark. Uh, before we, they knew anything happened, we were all intermingled, everyone firing each other. Uh, sadly, the San Francisco actually fired upon uh, the Atlanta uh, and killed Admiral Scott and all his crew and stuff. Uh, the ones highlighted in a, uh, orange here were all sunk. Uh, literally everyone else other than the Helena and the O'Bannon uh, suffered significant damage. We lost 1,400 in that battle alone. But that sacrifice scared off the Japanese a little bit because they did lose one battleship. Uh, Basically, it was sunk the next day by aircraft, but it was pretty much damaged significantly that night. Uh, and lo and behold, it saved Henderson Field from a massive bombardment. And this is a picture, supposedly maybe colorized, which what it would have looked like from Guadalcanal. I mean, you went from you know almost total dark within 10 minutes of an image that looked like this. Uh, Japanese and occasionally used searchlights, which normally brought their demise. Uh, most of our ships were flashless powder, but it generated a lot of smoke. And so once that gets going, it just illuminates the whole area. So you can imagine what the noise and the sound must have been like for the soldiers on a, you know, Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, going out and picking up the survivors and everything. Well, before you even had time to relax, another force was coming down the channel. And this time, the only heavy ship uh, Halsey had left were two battleships and some destroyers. This time, fortunately, uh, the admiral in charge of West Virginia, uh, oh, I always got to remember. Willis Lee, yes, uh, had grown up using the uh, radar control gunnery and had trained his troops, his sailors here, well how to use this. So just quickly in this battle, uh, which the Gwyn now is part of, there's, there's the Gwyn, South Dakota, Washington, they were kind of steaming down this way at the same time the Japanese were coming in through the slot, down through it. They split their forces, uh, destroyers came this way, the main force came through there. Basically what happened is radar detected him, he came around, engaged this group through, he was able to sink one of them. But now that with the destroyers in the lead, destroyers were right about here as the main force came through. Walkie, Benham, Preston, got wiped out almost immediately. Benham continued to survive for a while, and, and Dad on the Gwyn eventually was able to rescue them. What, again, the amazing thing was, so by about this time here, most of the destroyers have been sunk. The Gwyn had taken significant hits and basically was kind of out of uh, its uh, ability to do too much there. But the two battleships were there. The amazing thing what happened is when the South Dakota fired its guns, it lost, all, it tripped all the electric circuits on the ship. It went black. 
Uh, you couldn't control your guns, the radar, everything. Uh, this is one of the unforeseen things that happened. So there's a wild scramble. Uh, Washington is trying to figure out where is the South Dakota. <coughs> South Dakota is behind them, but it's black. Uh, uh, slowly the you know, circuits come back online, fires again, boom, they trip all over again. Last time, one of the senior electricians there said, enough of this tripping, ties the circuits, main circuits down. Next time it goes, it blows everything. So lo and behold, you, know, you have one battleship totally out of action. You have the Washington. Uh, but what kind of happens is the South Dakota meanders kind of this way. The Washington, trying to figure out where it does, kind of falls off. The Japanese now suddenly see this big looming thing and they totally focus on the South Dakota. They plaster it with everything they can get. The Washington, no one sees it. It kind of scoots off to the side. Uh, everyone's focused on the South Dakota. The only ship firing left from the US now is the Washington. But it, it kind of almost sneaks up on everyone, is able to take the Japanese battleship totally in its sights and plasters it. It plasters everything that it can see. Uh, and then so finally, Washington just keeps going up this way, hoping to kind of lead the rest of the forces away from the carnage that's down here. And the Japanese commander, with all the damage now to his battleship, loses kind of confidence. And once again, they withdraw. Whoops. There were, nope. So anyway. What's kind of recognized, Gwyn later on uh, is able to get the survivors from the Benham, sinks that, and then truddles back down to uh, 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 Espirito Santo and stuff. But with the extent of damage on it, it's sent back to Pearl Harbor and eventually to Mare Island. As kind of what was, okay, this is different, yeah. No, no, with this one. Let me just read it because you can't really uh, read here. But this was a description uh, from kind of the official records. Uh, it said at 0026, Gwyn opened fire on a cruiser and four destroyers. At 029, Walkie was ablaze and had pulled out a column. Benham and Preston were firing on destroyer targets. I mean, this is happening in the middle of the night. You know, everything's kind of going the pot around. At 0030, Gwyn hit her target with two consecutive salvos of five inch shells. At 0032, Preston exploded, and Gwyn received a hit from the cruiser. The shell entered the number two engine room. That's the second kind of engine room there, about four feet above the waterline. Exploded at the control station, killing all personnel in the upper level. The engine room at about 20 millimeter quick clipping room and gun four upper handling room was filled with steam, which drove the crew out of the spaces. At 0036, Gwyn ceased firing for a lack of suitable targets, and nine minutes later, the task force commander ordered all destroyers to retire. Well, that basically was Gwyn. But if you look at it, in a little over about a 10 minute stretch here, from the time you open fire to when everything's almost over, at least for the destroyers. So anyway, that kind of covered, took Gwen out of the pocket of the Solomons for quite a while. And so now, I was just kind of pointing out here, uh, <coughs> the war still moved on. By February, the Japanese had finally, had more than decided they needed to get out of Guadalcanal and finish uh, pulling out their last troops. Uh, now, the kind of the interest moves up the slot. The Guadalcanal campaign, as far as the Marines and everything else, most of the world think it's over, but it isn't. This is only the first step moving up the chain. So now we're moving on to New Georgia Island. 
which includes the Battle of Kula Gulf and finally the Battle of Kulambangara, uh, in which the Gwyn was sunk. Again, it's basically the battle of uh, the you know, Tokyo Express. Pointing out again New Georgia, this is the next big chain kind of up on the side. The slot is kind of ups, down. Yeah, always here. This is kind of the slot where normally the Tokyo Express comes up and down. But the decision by the Japanese is they were going to hold New Georgia as long as they could and call them Bangora. And the reason is they had an airfield on Munda Point, which we wanted to put out of action and seize. Actually, we wanted to use it ourselves. So Dad's next involvement was the Gwyn, which helped uh, provide cover for main, Marine troops landing on Rendova Island uh, so they could set up artillery positions to help the Marines on shore and the Army guys. Uh, later on, the Tokyo Express tried to come down through Kula Gulf, unload troops and supplies on Kalamangora to eventually be shuttled over to New Georgia. So the Battle of Kulamangora, again, not getting into a lot of detail, uh, but this was our order of battle. This time we had a fair number of destroyers. Three cruisers, uh, Ralph Talbert. The Gwyn uh, included uh, Commander Higgins, who was the original commander of the Gwyn, but now is the division commander for this grouping here. Uh, trying to remember the commander's name who commanded these. But basically, again, single line, destroyers up front, heavy cruisers here, destroyers up back. And what occurred is they, we noticed the Japanese coming down in their normal file. Uh, we tried, Admiral Willis, you want to cross the T, kind of position yourself sideways so you can bring all your guns to bear. Lo and behold, this time, the Japanese knew we were coming. They didn't have radar, but they had sensors which picked up the radar pulses and could even tell the direction. So long before we were getting ready for this, they already had launched a spread of torpedoes. As we were kind of just getting in a position for firing and to allow us to fire ours, uh, one of the torpedoes head home on the Leander, a New Zealand cruiser here. Well, that kind of threw things in a tizzy. Uh, the lander kind of peeled off. Uh, they gave two destroyers, I think Radford and Jenkins, to go along to kind of mine them. So this kind of became the meandering path of the Leander, who eventually decided to kind of come in and fire some torpedoes off. In the meantime, we had detected that the Japanese forces kind of had decided to kind of turn around uh, Admiral Ainsworth, by directing, we directed all our ships to make all turns and everything, kind of came around this way, detected they were kind of fleeing, said, let's go get them, charged up that way. A lot of destroyers couldn't quite keep up. For some reason, or other, the Gwyn was able to actually pass up a bunch of cruisers, get toward the front. So they were kind of up along this way. When they couldn't, they lost track of the Japanese here. It was a big squall. But then they kept following up, and you didn't think, you couldn't fire at them really at that distance so much. But then they turned around, kind of came back, and so now uh, Admiral Ainsworth said, ah, good, we're going to reposition. So he gave command for everyone to make a turn, gave them an azimuth to go on. And lo and behold, just before they did that, the Japanese forces turned around, sent their second salvos of torpedoes at us, never saw it coming. And lo and behold, every cruiser now uh, was damaged. The Honolulu and St. Louis had their bows blown off. And unfortunately, Gwyn, who was following those directions, caught a torpedo. Now let me just kind of read this thing. So almost you could close your eyes and picture you're in the dark. And it says, at 0214 hours, moments after the St. Louis was torpedo, Gwen turning with the cruisers was hit by a torpedo in her after engine room. Worst place you could get hit. 
She exploded violently, throwing up a thick column of black smoke with flames licking the surface of the water alongside. Gwen was hard hit, had lost all communications, and was burning steadily. She could still make a few turns on her starboard engine, which helped keep the smoke and flames aft while the, the damage control parties fought the flames and tried to check the flooding. I wish I could have asked my father to describe all of that. I just have a tough time. How do you keep your head when all of that's going on? And so anyway, you can't read that, so I'm going to read it for you. This was actually uh, written by uh, the commander on the Mari. That was the other destroyer I'd kind of mentioned, who actually came upon. And the Mari and the Ralph Talbert, the name I'd seen previous, were there kind of helping it. Uh, and this was reported from the Mori. Gwyn's light gray superstructure and dark blue hull, still unchanged from her Atlantic duty, was blackened aft of her forward stack. Her after superstructure was a twisted mass of wreckage. She was riding bow high, stern awash, but still afloat. The Ralph Talbot was shifting from her starboard side to tow along her port side. They were going to try and save her and get her back to Tulagi. About 8.45, an extra large group of zeros came in and were met by an equal number of our friendly fighters. A few minutes later, Gwyn reported she was settling and taking a list. Captain Fellows doubted he would make it to Tulagi. We could see how much deeper she was riding in the water, and her stern was submerged to the after deckhouse. That's pretty down, uh, if you think about it. Maury came alongside with eight officers, and the eight officers and 43 men of the salvage party came aboard. But, and this is kind of fun. But Captain Fellows and Commodore Higgins held back, each inviting the other to leave first. Mm -hmm. Finally, Commodore Higgins pulled rank, pointing out that having put her in commission and brought her to the Pacific as skipper, he had commanded the Gwyn longer than Fellows. <laughs> the younger officer bowed to his Commodore, and with a wry smile on his otherwise haggard face, boy, that would be me, complied with his wish. As soon as Fellows was aboard the Mori, Commodore Higgins stepped across, carrying a neatly folded set of striped pajamas and a few toilet items. This was his abandoned ship kit. <laughs> uh, Ralph Talbot took position to sink her. Now this goes back to the torpedo issue. She fired four torpedoes in succession from 1,400 yards. Three passed under the ship and continued out the other side. How would you like to have been that torpedo guy you know, who was doing this? The fourth hit abreast of her stack with a huge explosion. Gwyn broke in half. The stern sank at once, but the bow section went down slowly, uh, releasing huge bubbles. And under with her, she took the bodies of two officers and 59 men. Well, how do you end all of this? I guess the kind of the comment which was pointed out was, so ended the career of the only destroyer that survived the battleship action in the Solomon Islands. And a comment from one of her crew uh, there, she was a great ship, one of her crew said afterwards. But we knew we'd been living on borrowed time. I guess all of us knew that time, kind of time in the Solomons. And how true. You know, this was a story of only one destroyer, 14, that were sunk here. And literally, almost 100 more before the war will end. Uh, but again, that was kind of part of the story of my father, who was I was very proud of. <laughs> and just never really got to know him until, you know, kind of this effort. So anyway, thank you. And uh, if you want to see some of the items up here.